Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. I want to welcome you to our afternoon session. As most of you know, I am at this time in Rowan Mountain in Tennessee at the camp meeting there. But I didn't want to just abandon our afternoon Bible study, so I decided to record this study so we could have this presentation on this weekend when I'm missing. I will just continue where we would have left off last week, where we were looking at the beginning of chapter 12, we, the beginning of the second part of Revelation. Before we do anything else, let me just go ahead and pray. Make sure we have the Lord's guidance as we go through. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for this opportunity. As always, we are grateful that we can meet together to study your word and to fellowship together. I pray that you will direct in our meeting this evening that everything may be done to your honor and glory. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have been going through the book of Revelation. We, we finished what I would refer to as the first part the judgment of the kingdom of Christ, and we are now on the second part, the judgment of the kingdom of the beast. Last week, we looked at the, the main players in the controversy, the woman, the seed of the woman, the dragon, and the remnant of the woman's seed. And we saw that Satan's main purpose in the earth right now is to make war against the seed of the woman and we, we saw that the seed of the woman is really the remaining portion of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the seed of the woman. Jesus is the target of Satan's attack. Jesus is the one who is fighting his father's battle and restoring the kingdom. But in the absence of Christ himself in person, Satan attacks the remaining portion of Christ, which is the body of Christ, which constitutes we who are his children. Now, this week we want to go and look at the, the main tools that Satan is using. Let me just say something before I proceed any further. Um, I'm going to stop wherever one hour catches us. Okay, I'm not going to go over one hour. So wherever we are at the end of one hour, we'll stop there for today. And then next week, we will pick up from there. So I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen. Um, I do have some slides that I want us to use as the basis for this presentation. So here, I'm not even sure how the, what this recording is looking like because I'm actually using the new GoToMeeting. They told me that um, I have to migrate to the new one. So I'm using the new one. I'm not sure if on the recording you're going to be seeing two pictures side by side or whether that's going to be just the slides that we are looking at i hope it's just the slides but anyway so the question that we're going to examine this evening is who is the beast and of course you understand the reason for the question because there are many different ideas about the identity of this beast and some of them are really crazy ideas you know some people have heard people identify um, in, in the in the past, they they heard they said it could have been Henry Kissinger. Um, I've heard people say it's it was Barack Obama. I suppose there are even some people who say it is Donald Trump. And they the ideas that, to be frank, are crazy. Well, the best idea, fanciful thinking and lack of intelligent approach to the Bible. But even among those who study the Bible a little more carefully, probably one of the main ideas is that the beast represents the papacy. And of course, the papacy is the Roman Catholic institution, which is partly a church and partly a political power, with the Vatican as their political headquarters and the Roman Catholic Church as the religious arm of the papacy. The head of the papacy is the Pope. You know, a monarchy has a monarch at the head of it. The papacy has a pope at the head of it. So, very similar. So, some people believe that the papacy 
is the beast. I want to take a careful look at the Bible this afternoon to see if we can come to a rational conclusion as to what this beast really is. We know that the Bible was designed by the great God of the universe, our Father. And in particular, the book of Revelation was designed for his people at the end of time. You can be sure that if he gave us this book, he has also given us the tools to understand the book. And so we have every right to look at it and to try to understand. So, who is the beast? Now, we, we begin in Revelation 13 and verse 1. The last thing that we read last week was where the dragon was angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So that's the last thing. We saw the dragon going to make war with the remnant of the woman's seed. Now, chapter 13 begins, and maybe I should just look at the Bible here. Let me quickly bring up the Bible. If you look at Revelation 13, well, let me go back to chapter 12. In chapter 12, the last thing we see is that the dragon goes to make war with the woman, with the remnant of the woman, see. And then we go right over to Revelation 13. It says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now, let me just um, quickly look at another translation. If you look at the NASB, let me bring it up quickly. It says, and the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. When you go back to the King James Version, it says, and I stood upon the sand of the seashore. It suggests that John moves from where he is in heaven and he goes and stands on the seashore. But the other translations suggest that it is not John who stands on the seashore, but it is the dragon who stands on the seashore. And, um, you know, almost every other translation gives you the same meaning. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, NIV, World English Bible. It says, I stood on the sand of the sea. So some agree with the King James. The New English translation says, it doesn't give us that there, but in verse 12, I'm sure it says it. It says, and the dragon stood upon the sand of the seashore. So anyway, the point I really want to make is that what john saw really was the dragon standing on the seashore it makes more sense what what we are being told is that the dragon goes to make war against the seed of the woman the remnant of the seed and in making this war he goes to stand upon the seashore so why does he stand on the seashore because he's going to call his agent He's calling his agent out of the sea. So it's not John who stands on the seashore. It's the dragon who stands on the seashore and he calls the beast up out of the sea. That's what that's what that's the idea that God is giving us as we look at this picture. So it says the, the dragon stands on the seashore and John says, and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. We will come back and discuss that a little bit more closely in a little while. And on his horns, 10 crowns or 10 diadems, as it says here in this version. And upon his heads, names of blasphemy. All right, we, we'll come back to that in a little bit. So, the point that is being made here is that the dragon himself, Satan himself, is not the person who is actually carrying out the warfare. He's going to use an agent. He's going to use an entity. And that entity is a beast that he calls up out of the sea. So the next question I want to ask is what does a beast symbolize? If there happens to be somebody who is watching this video, I would like you to consider the question because there are people who believe that the beast represents a, a single individual. I've even heard people discussing the, the idea that the beast is a literal animal that comes up out of the sea. And of course, 
you know, sometimes we have to sympathize with some of these ideas because people just come to the Bible without any kind of background understanding and they just read something and they take it for liter they take it uh, that it is really literally so. We who have been studying the Bible, we understand that Revelation is full of symbols. And so we see a beast, a strange beast coming up out of the sea. We understand it's not a literal animal. But we want to understand what does it represent? Does it represent a, a single human? Does it represent some kind of entity, some kind of organization? What does it represent? Now, the Bible itself does not leave us in, in darkness. The book of, of Daniel is a counterpart to the book of Revelation. In other words, both of them uh, go hand in hand. And um, we find that in the book of Daniel, the symbols that are used are very similar to the symbols that we find in the book of Revelation. It's because both books were designed by God to go together. So God uses similar symbols in Daniel, in some cases the same symbols, but mostly similar symbols. And then if we can find out what it means in the book of Daniel, we can apply the same meaning in the book of Revelation. Now we look here at Daniel chapter 7, and we have a very clear description of what a beast represents. Look at what it says. Daniel 7 and verse 17. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Now, the, the, the verse says that a beast here represents a king. And so, if somebody says that the beast is a king or some, some outstanding ruler, then that person could be forgiven, I suppose. But yet, at the same time, sometimes it is unwise to take just one single verse. We need to expand a little bit and to see if there's any more information that we can add to our database of knowledge. And when you go a little further in the same chapter, in verse 23 of Daniel 7, Look at what he says. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom. The fourth kingdom. There we see that a beast is not simply a king, but it's a kingdom. All right, even though it says in verse 21 that the, these beasts represent four kings. In verse 23, it, it amplifies what it says and, and tells us that it represents for, for kingdoms, a beast is a kingdom. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse, different from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down, and break it in pieces. So, we can conclude then that a, a beast represents a kingdom, and not simply a king. And this is, this is something that we encounter all the time in the Old Testament, where God refers to kingdoms, and he speaks about kings he, he, he speaks of a king but he's really referring to the kingdom you know um in in daniel chapter 2 where he tells nebuchadnezzar about four great kingdoms that would rule the world when he refers to the first kingdom babylon he tells nebuchadnezzar you are this head of gold you 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 are represented by the first part of this image and he's speaking to nebuchadnezzar as an individual but in actual fact he, it's not nebuchadnezzar it's the kingdom of babylon so god does this many times he talks about kings when he's really referring to kingdoms so it says that these four animals came up out of the sea I know that some of this is basic for for many of us all right i'm just going to i'm going through it because there may be some people watching this presentation who are new to the topic and so we have to give them a little chance to grow what does the sea symbolize animals coming from the sea and again we find in revelation that there is an answer to the question the angel says to daniel and he said unto me the waters which thou sawest water where the whore Sitteth represents what? Peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So God tells us here that water represents 
especially much water. A lot of water represents many people, multitudes, nations, and, and, and different languages. So whenever God wants to represent people, nations, and so on, he uses water as a symbol here in the books of Daniel and the Revelation. Now I'm going to add a little something. And um, we, I, you will see later on why I do this. I, I believe that water always also symbolizes the old world, or in other words, the biblical world, the world of the Bible. And I'll just tell you quickly why I come to this conclusion, because it says that the beast rises up out of the water, out of the sea. Later in this chapter, we see another beast arising, and this one does not arise out of the water at all. This one arises out of the earth. And we discover that this second beast is also another great kingdom. But why doesn't it arise out of water? Why doesn't it arise among peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues? Well, maybe because it arises in a place where there, there are not many people, maybe. But perhaps also because it arises in a different part of the world. This second beast does not arise in the world of the Bible or the old world. You know, the, the world of the Bible was Europe and the Middle East and North Africa. That was the world of the Bible. That's where the Bible was written. And most of the, the nations and, and descriptions that we see center around that part of the world. That's why we call it the biblical world. But there was another part of the world that the Bible doesn't mention, like China and the, the, the Americas and Australia and the southern part of Africa. These, these areas are not mentioned in the Bible. They don't come into the biblical story at the beginning. So the old world is the biblical world. And um, so I'm suggesting that the waters represents the biblical world. But if we see a power arises where there's no water, it means it doesn't arise in the old world or in the biblical world, but in another part of the world, probably in the part that we would refer to as the new world. All right. Now, I'd like to make another distinction because we did say that a beast represents a kingdom. Now, I'm going to make another distinction because I, I, I'm going to show you that the Bible or God also represents a horn as a kingdom. So a beast represents a kingdom and a horn represents a kingdom. Why, why use... Two different symbols why would god do this and i will show you why in just a moment this is the beast or this is a representation of the beast that we saw in daniel 7 the fourth beast according to to, to the bible this beast had 10 horns on its head and um you know it had great iron teeth and claws of brass it has 10 horns on its head now, we discover that these horns, these ten horns, represent kingdoms. Uh, let me see if we can find that in the Bible. Let me go to the Bible and um, let me see. I think later down in Daniel 7, it explains what the, what the, the meaning of the, these ten horns. And... Um, See what it says in verse 23. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth. Notice what it says in verse 24. The ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. So we have seen already that a king is used to represent a kingdom. So these ten horns represent ten kingdoms that will arise out of this fourth beast kingdom so why are they called kingdoms also well what we can conclude is that a beast represents not a normal kingdom but what we would call an empire now most of us here will know what an empire is an empire is a kingdom that has that is made up of many different kingdoms okay many kingdoms go together to make up one kingdom it's called an empire but when there's just one kingdom with no sub kingdoms then it's just a kingdom 
That's what the Bible is showing us. And God represents those individual kingdoms as horns. But the kingdoms that are great kingdoms, massive kingdoms, with, with other kingdoms subdued and subjugated and subject to this one great kingdom, it's called, we call it an empire, and God represents it as a beast. So we can conclude that the four beasts that we were looking at represent four empires. And the ten horns on the head of the fourth beast, these are normal kingdoms. All right, so now we have some, some keys, some clues, some, some definitions that we can lean upon as we continue to study here in the books of Daniel and Revelation. So, you know, this is, this is a continuation of what Daniel saw. He saw the ten horns and he saw another horn come up among them, which had the eyes and the mouth of a man, the mouth speaking great things. And this little horn that came up, it destroyed three of the former horns or three of the original kingdoms. Now, history will show that this fourth beast represented the Roman Empire. And these ten horns represented the ten divisions into which the Roman Empire were bro was broken up. Rome was broken up into ten smaller parts. And then among those ten small kingdoms, there came up another kingdom which represented, it was a different kind of kingdom. It was, it was the papacy. Remember we talked about the papacy earlier on. The papacy is a combination of church and state. This church-state kingdom grew in Europe. The Roman Catholic institution became very powerful. It became the greatest, the most powerful political entity in, the, in all of Europe. And when it was coming to power, there were three kingdoms that stood in the way of the papacy. We, don't, we won't go into the details of that now. But these kingdoms were, they, were, were, were called the Heruli and the Vandals and the Ostrogoths, and the papacy insti instigated, organized with the other nations of Europe to destroy those three kingdoms. So as the, the papacy was coming into power, it destroyed three kingdoms, and that's what we see when we look at the book of Daniel and we look at this fourth beast. Ten small kingdoms with one bigger than the rest coming up and destroying three. Sub-kingdoms on the beast, but kingdoms nevertheless. Now, in, in Daniel 7, of course, what we are looking at is Satan's kingdoms. The kingdoms that he uses. And what the, why, why, why do we describe them as Satan's empires? They are, they are empires because they have other kingdoms under them, as I said. But they are Satan's empires because they represent the powers that Satan has used in his efforts to rule the world and to try to destroy God's people. There was Babylon, which is represented by the lion. Then there was a bear that came up, which is representing the kingdom of Medo-Persia. That one came after Babylon. Then after Babylon, what came next? We see a leopard with four wings and four heads, and that represents the kingdom of Greece. And then the fourth beast that Daniel saw in his vision was this terrible beast with ten horns, as we already described, which was the kingdom of Rome. Now, we'll come back to this in a little while, and you'll see why I, I mention it. You go to Revelation chapter 13, and you see one beast. We just saw this beast. The Bible says that this beast has what? Um, let me just highlight here. The Bible says that this beast, beast has seven heads. Three and three six and one seven. The beast has seven heads, and it also says that the beast has ten horns. Ten horns. There's a reason why these ten horns are in one place and they are not scattered among the heads like you normally see. But I'll explain that afterwards. So this is what. John sees in the book of Revelation. Now, when you go back to Daniel, Daniel's vision is different because Daniel saw four animals. John sees only one. And yet, there is a lot that tells you that both visions 
are some way related. And let's look at the relationship. All right, before we look at the relationship, let me highlight something else. In Revelation 17, we're jumping around a little bit, but you'll see why. We have to connect these chapters to make the connections to, to really see more clearly what the beast represents. Now, it says in Revelation 17, it, it explains certain things that we want to get in our heads. The seven heads, seven heads, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The seven heads are seven mountains, it says, on which the woman sits. And there are seven kings. Actually, this word there, you find that most translations translate it. And they, that is the seven heads are seven mountains, and they are also seven kings. So it doesn't, uh, my understanding is that it means they are represented as mountains, which is the same as kings. It's not, it's not that it represents seven mountains and then, then it also represents seven kings separately. No. In the Bible, nations, kingdoms are described by God as mountains. And we already saw that kingdoms are described as kings. So we are talking about seven great kingdoms or empires. He says five, five are fallen and one is and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue for a short space. All right, a lot of information here. But the point I want to make is that what God tells us here shows us that this beast with the seven heads is what we call a composite beast. What do I mean by composite beast? I mean, it is several beasts that are put together in one. God is giving us a picture of, of several different things in one image. He puts everything together and gives us one image. So why do, why do we conclude this? Because look at what it says. Five are fallen. Five of these heads do not exist at this moment. As, as God is discussing this with John, five of these heads do not exist. Yet we see them on the beast. Why do we see them if they no longer exist? Because God is giving us a panorama of the beast. The beast is a comp composite. God is showing us the history of the beast, the present of the beast, and the future of the beast. Now, at different stages, the beast has one head. Because right now it says, one is. That's what it says, isn't it? It says that one of the, the heads is. One is. There's only one head that the beast has at the moment. And I guess it's that head that we have in the middle. All right. One of the heads is. One has not yet even arrived and five are already gone. So the beast has only one head. But God shows us seven heads because God wants to show us the history of the beast as well. So there, there are seven heads that have followed each other in sequence right up to this point. Well, there are five and right up to this point, this is number six and one is still to come. That is what God is telling us. So we have one gone, two gone, three gone, four gone, five gone, and one is still to come. The one in the middle is the one that now is, all right? I, I, I expect the one with the head of a lion well. Maybe not, not necessarily, but one head still exists and um, one is still to come. The green question mark is the one that was future when John got the vision. And the five were those that had fallen. So we see that the beast, as I said, is a composite. It's, it's, it's many different nations, several different nations presented under one image because God wants us to understand that Satan's work in this world has been from the beginning concentrated in the great nations of the world. The greatest nations of the world have been Satan's tool that he has used in his efforts to try to destroy God's people. And that's what we are looking as we, that's what we are seeing as we are looking at this image that God has given us of this beast. Now Look at this panel because what we are trying to do here is show us how it correlates to the vision that Daniel had. 
Daniel's vision of four beasts represents four kingdoms. This vision in Revelation represents seven kingdoms. Four different beasts in Daniel, one beast in Revelation, but they are covering, to some extent, a similar area, similar time period. So what do we see? The lion in, in, in Daniel 7, representing Babylon, it's represented in the beast of Revelation 13 because the beast has the mouth of a lion. The bear represented the kingdom of Medo-Persia, and it's represented here in Revelation 13 because this beast has the feet of a bear. The leopard represented Greece, and we see it represented here because the beast has the body of a leopard. That's what we are told in Revelation 13. Now, the fourth beast, the great and terrible beast that had the ten horns, it's not mentioned in Revelation 13 here, except where it says that this, this, this fourth beast in Daniel made war against the saints, and it says the same thing about this beast in chapter 13. We see the similarity. Besides, here's an important thing. How many heads does the beast in chapter 13 have? It has seven heads. We look at Daniel and we only see four animals represented. But the beast in chapter 13 has seven heads. So we can conclude that those four in Daniel 7, they are a part of this beast in chapter 13. Plus three more. Okay, so you have Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome. That's four of the heads. Then you have three other heads. There are three other powers that are represented that are not mentioned in the book of Daniel. So the beast does not just deal with the time of Daniel. He deals with, with, with a time period that goes even before the time of Daniel. That's what we can conclude. And I will talk a little bit more about that as we proceed. Now in Revelation 17, we see a woman riding the beast. And um, it can be compared in Revelation in Daniel 7. The woman riding the beast can be compared to the, the little horn. And it's not exactly so because the beast, the woman I believe, this woman riding the beast, I think she's far more than this little horn. This little horn is the papacy. And I believe that the papacy is a part of this woman. Okay. Notice that it it was it, this horn was on the head of this fourth beast, the Roman beast. And this woman here is riding the beast. And she's different from the ten horns. So I believe she is related to this little horn here, but she is far more than the horn. And I just mentioned that we certainly are going to look at that more closely in the future. So the question I, I want to ask is who is the seventh head? Because what we can see is that five are, heads are fallen. That's what we were told. One now exists, and at the time when John got the vision, the one that was existing was the kingdom of Rome. So we, if we start with Rome, we said five, five have fallen, one is. So the one that is, is Rome, because that's the, the empire that is ruling at the time when John gets his vision. The one that is, is Rome. So how many, how many fell five? So before Rome, we are looking for five empires. So if we go back before Rome, the next one in line was Greece. All right, we are looking for five before Rome. Rome is number six, all right? So we have Greece. Then we have, what was before Greece? Medo-Persia. What was before Medo-Persia? Babylon. So you have, you have, you have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome now is. We know one is yet to come, but let's ignore that for a while. So you have Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, working backwards. So that means there are two that, that were there before Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome, because the beast has seven heads. And, and when you come to Rome, the angel says, five have already fallen. We know Greece fell, Medo, Persia fell, Babylon fell, but the angel said five, not three. So there are two empires that were there before Babylon. And they are also represented on the beast. Now, if you go back into history, two of the great empires that we can mention are the Assyrian Empire and the Egyptian Empire. Now, people will say those were not the greatest empire, and I don't know. I'm not, I'm not really much of a historian. 
But what, what I do know is that the two great empires that had the greatest impact on Israel were the Assyrians and the Egyptians. Remember, what we are looking at in the prophecy is Satan's agent. And what does Satan do with his agents? He uses them to try to destroy God's people, God's movement in the world. So you can simply go back and ask, what are the great empires that have tried to destroy Israel? The first of them was Egypt. Egypt, when the Pharaoh gave a command to kill the firstborn, every, every male, not, not the firstborn, every male among the Egyptians, he was trying to wipe out Israel. And then later on, he tried to destroy them at the Red Sea. We know that. Okay, so Egypt, Egypt was the first empire that tried to destroy God's people, Israel, as a nation. The next empire that tried to do it and, and had great success was the Assyrian Empire. Many people don't know that the Assyrian Empire destroyed 10 of the tribes of Israel. Those 10 tribes basically don't exist today. Nobody knows who they are, where they are, because the Assyrians took them away captive and scattered them to the four winds. Nobody knows what happened to those 10 tribes. What we call Israel today is really three of the tribes that remain. The, 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 the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin and the Levites who were not a part of the 12 tribes. They were the priest class. They also were, uh, went with, they also were with Judah and they were not destroyed by the Assyrians because by that time, Israel had been split into two parts, the 10 tribes and the other three tribes, which the three tribes were ruled by the descendants of David while the other tribes were ruled by different kings at different times. But Assyria destroyed those 10 tribes. And then the, the, the remaining tribes, Judah, were taken captive by the Babylonians who tried to dis, who destroyed the land, slaughtered many of the people, and took them away captives to Babylon. So those were the first three that tried to destroy God's people. And that is why I'm looking at Egypt and Assyria as the other two heads. Anyway. I think I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But the question is, who is the seventh head? So here are the nations, as I just described. Egypt, first nation to try to destroy God's people. Assyria succeeded in destroying the 10 tribes. Babylon carried away the Jews captive for 70 years. Medo-Persia tried to destroy the Jews in the time of Haman when they made a death decree against the Jews. They were miraculously saved by God. Greece, the Greeks oppressed the Jews and again made wars against them and, um, you know, offered swine in their temple, swine's blood in their temple. And, you know, generally made war against the Jews for a, an extended period of time. And of course, Rome, we know that Rome is a kingdom that eventually destroyed Judah carried away the Jews captive into all nations and, um, you know, emptied the land of Jews for, for thousands of years. Rome destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed Judea back in AD 70. So these are the, the first six heads of the beast. Now it says that after this, there would come a seventh head. There is a head that is mentioned and Paul says, and not Paul, the angel told John that the seventh head is not yet come. When he comes, he must remain a short space. Now, to understand what is this power, we ask ourselves, what power ruled in that part of the world after Rome? And if we look around, we can't find any kingdom that really dominated that part of the world. You know, we have, we have had outstanding kingdoms and even empires you know we had the spanish empire the portuguese built an empire the english built an empire the french built an empire of sorts and um you know even germany the, the they went out and colonized other nations and built an empire but none of them really conquered europe the old world none of them conquered the the, the territory of the former roman empire Instead of this, what happened is that we had something coming into being several decades ago, which we call the European Common Market, which has 
which has developed into what we call the European Union. It's, it's a unified Europe once again, but this time not by means of war, this time by means of, by peaceful means, by diplomatic means, Europe is trying to rebuild the old Roman Empire. And in a sense now, Europe, while it is an extension of Rome, has also become a seventh head on the beast. It's another, it's another kingdom that governs and controls most of Europe. So the, the, the Bible says, God said that this seventh head will remain for a short space. We see that in Revelation 17. And to some extent, you know, I'm, I'm talking off the top of my head. I'm not, we're not really looking at the verses. This is our third time going through the book of Revelation. So I'm kind of taking it for granted that most of us are familiar with the verses. This seventh head, this seventh head, the European Union, I am suggesting the Bible says it would last for a short space. And that is the thing. That's the thing. You know, what else? There, there, there are different, different ideas people come up with as to what this fourth head represents. Some say this fourth head is a papacy. You know, I've heard it said that this fourth head can be this particular nation or this particular nation. But here's the problem. Most of the, 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 the kingdoms that are suggested, most of the entities that are suggested, they have lasted for long periods. The papacy, for example, came into power in 538 AD. And it never lost that temporal power until about 1798. Nearly, nearly 2,000 years, well over 1,000 years, the papacy dominated for. It could not be said to have lasted for a short space. I mean, none of these other empires lasted so long apart from Rome. You know, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, they lasted like 100 years, 200, 167 years, 200 and something years, maybe 300 years at the most. The papacy lasted much longer. And even the empires that we would mention in Europe, like the Spanish, the British, they lasted for extended periods, hundreds of years. The EU has only lasted so far for decades, not 100 years yet. And according to the Bible, it would last for a short space. And I think that in a short while, the European Union will break apart. Anyway, that remains to be seen. But this is how I see these seven heads on, on the horn. Now, we're going into some places where I don't want to confuse you. But what we're actually looking at Revelation 13 and Revelation 17 in one. Why? Because those are the two chapters in the Bible that give you descriptions of the beast. There's one beast, but it appears in Revelation 17 and also in chapter 13. Now, I think I'm going to, well, let me just quickly touch on this point because I'm not going to dwell on it too long. If you look at um, Revelation 17, it's, it says that the horns of the beast, it does not mention that they have crowns. But if you look at Revelation 13, it says that, the horns are wearing crowns. And why is this so? Because when it comes to Revelation 17, it says that the ten horns, the ten horns have received no kingdom as yet. The horns that we see on the beast, remember the beast has ten horns. And let me make a point. I'm going to skip back a little bit. All right, bear with me. I'm going to skip back. All right. This, this is the beast of Revelation 13. This is the beast of Revelation 13. I want you to notice that this beast, this beast has 10 horns. And they are wearing crowns. And um, let me go back a little bit little bit still further this is the beast of daniel 7 this is the beast of daniel 7 and this beast has this beast has had 10 horns and then this horn here this bad horn plucked up three of the horns one two three so the beast ended up with seven horns 
Now, people always tend to think that, okay, the beast in Daniel had 10 horns. So when you come to Revelation and you see this beast in Revelation having 10 horns, it's the same 10 horns. Wrong. That's not true. Although it says 10 horns, it's a different set of horns. And we know this because when you come to Revelation um, 7, 17, the verse we were looking at, it says that these 10 horns have received have received no kingdom as yet. And this is a time of Rome. Okay? But they will receive power as kings one hour with the beast. And these 10 horns, these 10 horns, they do not get broken up into seven horns. No, 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 no. The 10 horns remain until the coming of Jesus. They are destroyed at the coming of Jesus. These are not the same horns in Daniel 7. So I just want us to be not confused about that. At some point, they will receive their kingdom, and that is why they are seen as wearing horns, as wearing crowns. When you look at the beast in chapter 13, when you, you get a panorama of the beast, you get the whole history of the beast in one vision, then you see that the horns are wearing crowns because you are looking at the entire history of the beast. But then you go to chapter 17, chapter 17, where we are looking at the beast, beast at a specific moment in time. When the sixth head is, and the seventh has not yet come, and the horns have not, have not yet received any kingdom, then they are not presented as having horns, because at that time, they have not received any kingdom as yet. So I hope that that kind of explains and makes things a little clear. Maybe confusing for some people. I hope I didn't confuse you too much. So if, if you look at this diagram, what I've tried to do here is, is to represent the beast as a diagram. So we can put things in their proper place proper context, proper time. So what we can see here is that the beast rep is represented by this red rectangle. The history of the beast from beginning, from the time of Egypt, here you have this big E, right down to the end of the ten horns. So the history of the beast has taken in the entire history of the world from the days of Egypt right down to the coming of Jesus. Right? So the beast is not an end time entity. It's an entity that has come into being from the days of Abraham, days of Egypt. All right? So right after the flood, you could say, almost uh, almost after, right after the flood, a couple of hundred years after the flood, this beast came into existence. And what is the beast again? The beast is the, the kingdom, the great kingdom on earth that Satan has been using. Now, he started off using the, the Egyptians, as I said. Then he used the Assyrians. Then he used the Babylonians. Then he used the Medo Persian. Then he used the Greeks. Then he used the Romans. And the seventh head, as I suppose, is the European Union. That's my idea. Um, some people may have different ideas about head number seven, but that's what I think head number seven is. Now, during the history of this, this beast, this seven head, these seven heads, the woman has been riding the beast. So the woman is not just the papacy. It's not the papacy. It's not the Roman Catholic institution. It's not any particular group or church or even, a part, or even any particular religion. It represents the religious system, the satanic religious system that has dominated and influenced the great nations of the world from the beginning to the end. There's always some religious element that is influencing these nations. And that religious element, just like how these different kingdoms are shown as one beast. So these different religious elements are shown as one woman. But basically, the woman represents false religious system, including false Christianity. And the Bible refers to everything here, this woman, as Babylon. Now, the Bible says that this seventh head will remain a short space. When this head falls, there are no more heads. But instead of seven heads, there comes ten horns. The beast himself, this beast now, this beast appears in his true nature. Now, it is no longer working through heads. I don't know what kind of kingdom this is going to be. We have an eighth king, but this time it's not a head. It's the beast without a head. I don't know what that looks like, but that's, that's what the Bible says, because there are only seven heads 
instead of a head, no, the beast appears and there are 10 horns. So these 10 horns only come into existence after the heads are gone. That's why I'm telling you they are not the same heads as the ones in Daniel 7. Now they receive power the same time as the beast appears. And they continue for a short space. The Bible refers to it as one hour. I don't believe the one hour means a literal measurement of time. I think it means at the same moment in time. These ten horns, the Bible says, they will, they will destroy the woman. They will destroy the woman, these ten horns. And they will make war against Christ along with the beast. But Jesus will return at this point and destroy the horns and destroy the beast. The woman is already destroyed. All right. So Jesus returns at this point and that's what happens. So this diagram kind of outlines the sequence as we see based on the book of Revelation. But I'm really focusing on the question of who is the beast. And I think we have answered that question. Let's continue a little bit further. And we'll probably answer this final question and then we're going to close off for today. Why does the beast mirror Satan? And what do I mean by this? I mean that if you go to the book of Revelation in chapter 13, you will see that the beast has seven heads and ten horns. All right, upon his horns, ten, ten crowns. And if you go, if you look at, let me bring up Revelation on the other side. I want it on this side. Revelation chapter. All right, let me bring up 13 on this side and Revelation 12 on this side. If you look at Revelation 12, look at what it says. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten, ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And if you look at Revelation 13, I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns upon his horns, ten crowns. Same thing it says about the dragon. A great red dragon. And a beast. Having the same exact description. Now, this has, this has led some, some misguided people to say that the beast and the dragon are the same. Not true. That's nonsense. God is not trying to confuse us. Why would God, why would God describe Satan as a dragon? And then come and take the beast and describe the beast as Satan. And then take the beast to represent Satan at the same time. No, that's nonsense. But why does God show us that Satan and the beast has the same description? The reason is God is showing us that Satan's work in the world, Satan's work in the world from the beginning has been through seven heads and ten horns at the end. And then he shows us the beast having seven heads and ten, horn, ten horns. So what we are to understand is that Satan's work in the world, completely from beginning to end, has been through the beast. Satan, the beast, in other words, has the characteristics of his parent, of his father, Satan. The beast, the beast is, the, is Satan's representative on the earth. It's the agency that Satan is working through. The seven heads are Satan's Satan's seven empires, the seven stages of Satan's government in this world. And the ten horns are the final stage. So in everything we can see that, um, you know, God, God is consistent and showing us the reality as we look at these images. So here's a little chart that kind of simplifies it. The dragon, the dragon is represented as having seven heads. The beast in chapter 13 has seven heads. Same beast in chapter 17 has seven heads. The dragon has ten horns. The beast in 13 has ten horns. The beast in 17 has ten horns. It's the same beast. It's not two different beasts. And, they bo and, and, and this beast represents Satan's baby, if I can put it that way. The dragon is said to be a red dragon. And in... Um, Revelation 17, the beast is said to be a scarlet colored beast. Scarlet and red, basically the same color. If you're a man, you don't even know the difference. The next thing that we see happening is that um, the beast, the, the dragon has 
seven crowns because Satan's Satan has seven great empires that he works through. And the beast is shown as having ten crowns because not the beast, the ten horns has ten crowns because they receive their kingdom at a certain point in time and then they are crowned. Satan, Satan's kingdoms are the major kingdoms. He, he deals with empires. The beast deals with horns. These horns have crowns. But Satan, his heads are crowned, if that makes sense. Anyway, what I'm focusing on is the fact that there is this great correspondence between these entities showing that they are the beasts of 17 and 13 are the same. And that same beast is Satan's baby, is the baby of the dragon. Yeah, I guess I should answer this last question. Can the beast be Satan himself? No, the beast cannot be Satan. It's a different entity from Satan. In spite of the fact that they have seven heads and ten horns, if you go to Revelation 16, John says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Revelation represents them as three separate and distinct entities. The dragon is one. Frogs coming out of his mouth. The beast is another one. And the false prophet is another one. Three separate and distinct entities. They are not the same. So, I think I am just about out of time here now. And just about to end. Let me see if there's anything more that I just have to say before we part for the evening. We already looked at this. Can the beast be the papacy? One last point. Churches are represented by women. All right. The Church of Christ, Israel, is represented in Revelation 12 as a woman standing on the moon and being clothed as the sun. The great false religious system is represented as sitting on the beast. The beast cannot be a church system. Beasts represent empires, as we said before. It's not women that represent empires. So the beast cannot, the, 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 the Catholic Church, the papacy, cannot be represented as a woman. It's a poly, um, what am I saying? The beast cannot represent the Catholic Church. That's what I mean. The beast cannot represent the Catholic Church because churches are represented as women. Beasts represent empires. And, um, you know, here we see an image of the woman being destroyed by the beast. That's the second thing. The woman, which includes the Roman Catholic system, which includes every false religious system, is destroyed by the beast. So the beast cannot be the Roman Catholic Church because otherwise the, the Roman Catholic Church would destroy itself. If you see what I'm saying. So basically, this brings us to the end of our time for today. I think I, I just about covered one hour. And so the question of who is the beast, I hope we have seen enough evidence to have a fairly good idea of who the beast is and what the beast is not. As we continue to study together, we will continue to explore these topics a little more closely. And hopefully, we will find that things become more and more clear as we study. Brothers and sisters, I'm sorry I can't be with you. I could not be, have been with you this week, but I hope that, you know, we were able to benefit from the study. And the thing, well, I'm sure that this week, some people will be grateful that we were able to have this study without any interruptions. God bless you. I'll see you next week. All right, let's pray before we close. Our Father, thank you so much for the privilege we have had of studying together this week. Thank you for the blessing of your word. And thank you that as we study together, you make things so clear, so clear that we don't need to be in confusion. And even if we are wrong, we can understand that we are not far off. Thank you, Father, for blessing us, for always doing far more for us than we are able to ask or think. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, beloved. God bless you. See you next week.